so we're going to start with a game tonight. And unless you're one of the lucky people that I said, come in my office and play this with me, then once you can tell what it is, I want you to shout it out, okay? Um, this is interactive. Be rowdy, be creative. So it's a game called Pixelate. It's an image that is super pixeled, and I want to see if you can figure out what it is before you see the clear image. So we'll rock with the first one. It's super easy. Go ahead. We may actually need to cut the lights just a little bit so you guys can see. Okay, hay bale, good job. I'm so impressed. Okay, so next picture, maybe a little bit more difficult. Velociraptors, yes, my favorite animal, my spirit animal. Okay, next. Deer, it's a buck, good job. Okay, good luck. It is grumpy cat with fall leaves, okay. All right, last one. A dabbing unicorn. Okay, that's all I got for the game tonight. But I got to say, so some of you could figure out certain pictures faster than others, right? So if you spend a lot of time in the woods with deer, maybe that one was faster for you to pick up on. For those of you that maybe saw a dabbing unicorn, I have no idea how you picked that out. But um, hey, <laughs> more power to you. But I got to tell you, sometimes when we approach scripture, it's similar to that. Because there are some passages that we come up to and we're like, what is even going on? And that is how I was with tonight's passage. Um, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 tonight. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open there. I will do the same. We're going to be in verses 25 through 40. If you've got your app, go ahead and pull that open. There is actually a lot of scripture tonight um, in our study. Would one of you turn the fan a little bit? It's blowing my Bible pages everywhere. Thanks, guys. Um, so we're going to have a lot of scripture tonight. So if you pull up the app, they're all listed in there. So it'll be super nifty for you. Um, but sometimes passages are difficult to understand. Um, and this particular text tonight is one that is not necessarily easily reconciled. Um, I mean, we can get the gist of what Paul's saying, but it doesn't seem to fit in with the context of scripture overall. Um, we're going to go ahead and read the text and then we'll jump into it. So. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, um, verse 25 through 40, it says, Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. Insert the first, huh? And those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided, and the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong and if it has to be, let him do as he wishes. <clears throat> let them marry. It is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity by having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Yet it is my judgment she is happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. 
seems to be a bit of a conundrum. Paul seems to definitely have something against marriage. In fact, the subtitle for tonight's message is Paul Hates Marriage, um, because that's what it seems like. And I know when I first would read the text before I was married, I was like, okay, I'm doing good. But now that I'm married, I'm like, so Paul, what's up? Are you saying that I can't serve Jesus as well because now I have pledged to serve God alongside this really hunky man? Jen Wilkin is an author of a book that I love called Women of the Word, and I think that it is inappropriately titled. I think it should be called People of the Word because it simplifies hermeneutics in a beautiful way. And she says, the heart cannot love what the mind does not know. And if we really want to know God and know his word and love him and love his word, then we must know God's word. We have to dig into the trenches of it. And oftentimes when we find the spot in scripture that confuses us, that maybe offends us, as scripture should sometimes, a spot that maybe gives us a bit of a hang up and we're like, I'm not so sure I'm okay with that. It shouldn't be something that causes us to walk away. Instead, it should be an invitation to dump, to jump in. It should be an invitation to dig deeper in the trenches of God's word. Um, some of the girls I meet with that we study that book I was talking about, I say that these moments are an X marks the spot moment. It is saying that there is buried treasure here for you to find. And I believe that if we will take God at his word in that invitation, and if we will dig into those places, that God is going to show us something that is beautiful and that is life-changing. But you have to be willing to get uncomfortable to get there. So a couple of tips I want to share with you that I have to remind myself before jumping into these passages to make sure that I am studying it correctly. Um, it's basically like five keys to hermeneutics, or hermeneutics 101. And this is not in the app, so if you want to remember it, you'll have to jot it down. Um, first, we need to take a God-centered approach to Scripture. We need to remember that the Bible is a book about him and not about us. So when we first see this text and it's all about marriage and all this kind of stuff, we need to step back and remember first this is about God before it's about me. Let scripture interpret scripture. Don't ever look at a passage just in isolation of its own. Not just one verse, but a group of verses, and that's part of why we teach on such large portions of scripture, because we want to make sure that we are not pulling something out of context. And then look in other passages, because the Bible is one seamless message of God's desire to redeem mankind and have a restored relationship with them for his glory. That is the story of scripture. The next, the third thing is to pay close attention to context. You got to know what's going on. And you guys have a pretty good grasp of context because we've been in 1 Corinthians for a while. So you've had a running start up to this passage. And if you guys are excited to see what's next, maybe you've read ahead or you're familiar with 1 Corinthians or even other of Paul's letters. Um, But we also need to know not just the context of the passage, but the context of the culture and the history of what's going on around Um, The fourth thing is, Scripture can never mean what it was never supposed to mean. Scripture cannot mean something for us that it was never meant to mean to its original audience. So if we're going to pull it out and just immediately make an application to us that the author did not intend for it to have, there's a good chance that you are misapplying Scripture. The fifth thing is, we need to see first what it means to its original audience. Because if we're able to see what it says to its original audience... We need to see how it fits in with scripture and what it is saying about God. Then we can make the application for how it applies to ourselves. So walk with me through that. We're going to talk about the context first tonight. So what is Paul talking about? Honestly, this passage seems a lot to me like when your parents say, yes, you can make that decision. I trust you to make that decision. It's kind of what Paul seems to be saying here. Like, I mean, you can make the decision of getting married or not, but... I think I can trust you'll make the right decision. That's kind of what it seems like he's saying. But we're going to zoom out and see this greater historical context. Let's run back to 146 B.C. If we run back to 146 B.C., we see that Corinth was totally destroyed, decimated, leveled, an abandoned ghost town um, by the Roman commander Lucius Mummium. If I mispronounce it, come find me later. I don't speak Latin. Um, So Lucius Mummium decimated the city of Corinth. It is like... Nothing. And then in 44 BC, Julius Caesar decides, hey, that was actually a really good spot to have a trade town and with all of the shipping and the commerce that can happen there. So let's rebuild the city of Corinth. And so it was actually then a colonia of Rome. So even though it's nestled in the heart of Greece, it's a Roman colony. So looking back at the ancient architecture, the words written are actually inscribed in Latin, not in Greek. And the style of the architecture is Roman, not Greek. So this colonia nestled in the middle of Greece is actually a little Italy. It's a piece of Rome. 
Then 70 years later, so as the city flourishes and grows and is made up of freedmen, and there's this prosperous trade, and they become really, really rich. And about 30 AD, this is when we see Paul's conversion. See, he was Saul, and he was persecuting the church, and he was adamantly against everything that they stood for. And then he meets Jesus on the Damascus Road, and he completely surrenders his life, does a 180, and then he becomes a church planner and a preacher and a person who is converting people and showing them to Jesus Christ. Then fast forward to 42 AD, we have James, the half-brother of Jesus, and he was beheaded. In 49 AD, the Jews were expelled from Rome, and then around 50 to 52 AD, this is when Paul had his first missionary journey or his first, this trip, his first visit to Corinth. And he was there for actually a year and a half. So he spent a lot of time with these people before he wrote this letter. And then in 55 AD, he wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians. And in 64 AD, Nero launched his persecution against Christians. Um, I was reading an article online and I wanted to share with you a few snippets from it. Um, it says that most Roman magistrates gave the Christians many opportunities to renounce their strange, unpatriotic beliefs before condemning Christians to death in the arena or by formal execution. They absolutely could not understand why a Christian would choose a shameful, agonizing public death over being reinstated as a full citizen with all privileges when all the person needed to do was make a sacrifice for the health of the emperor or even just sprinkle a little incense over a lighted altar. So seeing that, do you see why Paul cared so much about the little things that the people were doing? But see, the crowds who would come to these games, you remember talking about gladiators in the arena and like the bloodbath and all that is. Um, the crowds who came to witness this sometimes were worked up in such a frenzy of hate because they hated these Christians. They considered them to be antisocial scum. And they clamored for their painful death in the arena being mauled and torn apart by wild beasts, sometimes lions, sometimes crocodiles, and forced to fight gladiators who killed them for public spectacle. And then you move on and you see that the most famous era of persecution or the kickoff to this um, was under Nero. See, there was this disastrous fire in Rome and he blamed it on the Christians, even though he likely said it himself. And he even started killing a lot of Christians to show like, yeah, see, they meet in the catacombs and the fire started below. It had to have been the Christians that burned Rome. And so it launches this intense hatred for the Christians even more so, where it became more and more common for them to be tossed into the arena for people to enjoy watching their death. He had many of them killed. Some were crucified in the arena, thrown to wild animals. Others were burned alive as living torches to light Nero's garden at his golden house. See, this is what's going on right around the time that Paul writes this letter. And in 65 AD, what is it, 15 years after Paul writes this letter, Peter and Paul were executed and martyred for their faith. And from 60 to 218 A.D., this was the first era of pers Christian persecution, 150 years. And it wasn't until 313 that Christians had the legal right to worship as they pleased. See, I think when I read that context, I have a little bit more understanding why Paul was saying, I mean, if you need to get married, that's fine. But maybe it's going to be easier for you if you don't. So what it meant for them, Paul's instructions for single people. Virgins, when he says that, he's also talking about like your single people and he's talking about the betrothed. He's encouraging them to remain single. Remaining unmarried lets you be totally devoted to your service to the Lord. They're not going to be faced with these really intense dilemmas that are going to implicate multiple people. If you're married, though, he says stay married. Don't take like the easy route where you're not going to have to make hard decisions and abandon the people that are your responsibility like, keep serving God together. Be devoted to the person that you're married to. You can still serve God together, just differently. And I got to tell you, being married to a man of God, it is such a beautiful thing to serve God alongside him. And people often ask me, how did I know that he was the one that I wanted to marry? And the first thing that I always say is that he is the best example of Christ I have ever known. I have never known a man more like Jesus. He is a man of such peace and such compassion and such tenderness. Um, he is not a man marked by any sort of harshness or hostility. And I can definitely be that way myself. And instead of chastising me or criticizing me, he has this humility that reprimands me better than any sort of harsh word that he could say. And I thought to myself when I met him and when I was getting to know him, I said, that is a man who will make me a better woman that loves Jesus. And that is a man that I can serve God well with. 
And it helped that we had mutual interests, and it helped that he was, like, super good looking. And it helped that we enjoyed each other's company. But I got to tell you, first and foremost, he was a man that was much like Jesus. And I knew that we could serve God well together. See, Paul says both marriage and singleness is good. But he also says that both are a calling. And then he addresses the widows, and he says, you know what, you can remarry. That's fine. If you remarry, make sure that you marry a believer. But singleness is beneficial, and it allows for a more focused devotion. So what does this mean for us? Because we're not exactly living in a place of hostile persecution, and Scripture talks a lot about marriage in a beneficial way, so what do we do with this text that Paul's talking about, and how do we apply it? Well, first, I think that there's one thing that really stands out, and this is, this is part of what Nicholas and Nathaniel and Ryan have talked about in several weeks ago, too. And the first thing is Paul's telling us we need to live for the Lord. We see this in verses 25 through 31. He's saying whether you're married or single, betrothed or widowed, the call is the same to live for the Lord. Romans 14, 8 says, if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. And realizing that Paul pled that message all the way to the end of his life, to me, gives a lot of credence to what he meant when he said, live for the Lord always. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1 says, as for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. As in fact, you are living. Now we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. So we were never told, they were never told, the early church was never told, be complacent with how well you're living for the Lord, but strive to live better for the Lord. There's a quote that I read in one of the commentaries, and it said, If life brings sadness, live beyond it, but do not be bound by it. If things are joyous, do not be engrossed in them. Those who are blessed with material possessions are not to cling to them as though they have them always. And the thing I want to ask you, we're called to live for the Lord, but do we often live for ourselves instead? Do we often live for our momentary pleasures? We want to have the acclaim of success. We're identified by our GPA instead of our relationship with God. You know, we are either more uplifted or torn down depending on how our day goes with relationships with other people or a class or a grade than we are in what our time in the Word and our time with the Lord looks like. And sometimes it's in big ways, and sometimes it's in small ways. Do I choose Netflix before I do my Bible study? I mean, I I own my fair share of Netflix. But if I'm putting it before God, I'm choosing to live for myself and not for him. Paul's telling us to live for the Lord. He says, live properly in complete and undivided devotion for the Lord. Nothing held back. See, he doesn't want just most of us. He wants all of us. And he's telling us that it's going to be a life that is worth living if we're going to do that. I got to tell you, some of the most content and happy people, the most satisfied people I have known, have been those that have not had anything compared to the world's perspective. Maybe their house was due for a remodeling several decades ago, and maybe they don't have the trendiest this or the best that, and maybe most people don't look to them and say, oh yeah, they're movers and shakers of this, that, or the other. But they've learned to live in contentment because they choose to live for the Lord first and foremost. John Piper says, don't sink your roots too deep into this world. See, we weren't created to stay here forever, right? We were created for an eternal relationship in heaven with God. And when we sink our roots too deep here, I think and oftentimes that lessens our desire for eternity with God and it increases our desire to remain here. I love the song, Never Been More Homesick Than Now. Um, And that song came out on the radio at a really crucial time in my life. My parents were going through a divorce and a separation and um, it was a time that I really felt I could say, you know, I've never been more homesick than now. I yearn for heaven because this life doesn't really make sense. Things that I thought were sure aren't anymore. And as much as this life is a blessing that God has for us and he has things he wants us to accomplish and there are wonderful, beautiful things here, I think we should always yearn for God's presence more. But when we're clinging to the things of the world so tightly, we lose that focus. But then Paul goes on and he says, I want you to be free from anxieties. And we see this in verses 32 through 34. But you got to ask yourself, Paul had a lot of hardships, so what is he talking about? Like, he didn't have a lot of money. He was working really hard. He was, like, running for his life. He had all these legal problems. And then let's throw in there, like, a shipwreck because his story wasn't interesting enough. Like, there's all of these different things happening. What's going on here? 
He wanted the church to be spared from a particular kind of anxiety. He wanted them to be spared, and I think, honestly, in the context here and with the context of the persecution at large, um, the choice of family or Christ. Because I think that can complicate things a little bit. I love my family. I love the life choices that my husband and I have made. Mo, I hope you don't mind that I'm going to use you as an example. She and I minister differently because where we are is different. She is able to love you guys hard without second thought in a lot of ways that I really have to think about. Because those nights that I'm with you till 2 a.m. cost me time with my family at home. It costs me bedtimes with my children. And I'm not saying that begrudgingly because I love you guys and my husband talk about it and pray about it. And maybe I'll duck out for a little while so I can go put them into bed and then I'll come back and we'll play bang or something like that because it's a lot of fun. And because I love you guys and I love loving you towards Jesus, but there's this tension there. And Paul's saying, I don't want that for you. I want you to be able to love God in an unbridled way. And yes, you can still serve God this way too. And there's beautiful blessings in ministry. I love talking about God with my babies. Darcy asked me yesterday if when we go to heaven, Jesus gets us in a shiny car. It was an interesting theological discussion with my four-year-old. I didn't really know how to answer it. Like, I don't know, probably not a shiny car, but... um, You know, so there's these beautiful things, too, in being able to raise up women that are going to love and serve God passionately. But I got to tell you that there's sometimes those tensions in life with family. See, there's certain stresses and anxieties in our life that we can't entirely remove. So what does that look like? And I want to tell you it's practicing trusting God. Read with me 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 through 11. It says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. A reminder, he says all, not just the things that you're comfortable trusting him with, not just the things that are convenient for you to trust him with, but cast all your anxieties on him, including those super private things that you wrestle with that you don't exactly want to put in his hands. Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. See, the enemy is hungry, and you guys look pretty tasty to him. He wants nothing more than to see you take your eyes off of Christ. Verse 9, resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And I love here that we continue to hear that echo of persecution. But also, I got to tell you, if I see a prowling lion coming towards me, standing firm, feet planted is probably not going to be my initial instinct, right? Right? You see a lion coming towards you ready to take a snack. Standing firm is probably not going to be my first reaction, but that's what Peter tells us to do. Verse 10, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. See, trusting God isn't a guarantee of lack of trial and difficulty, but there is a promise in the end that you will be strong, firm, and steadfast. And I don't know about you, but those days that I'm tapped and I'm beyond myself and I have nothing left to give, the reminder that he's there and that he's going to continue to pour into me, to pour into others, it's such an encouragement. So how do you live a less anxious life? We talked about practicing trusting God, and I think we also have to practice having faith in God. I love Hebrews chapter 11. I got a tattoo based on a passage from this, this section of scripture. And I encourage you, if you don't know where to study or where to, st- to be at, camp out here and use this as a springboard to read some other Old Testament and New Testament stories because this is the hall of fame for our faith. And this chapter is beautiful and it's filled with unlikely people that made unimaginable mistakes. Some doozies that are hopefully a lot bigger than anything that we are ever going to do. Okay. There is some pretty big mistakes in this passage, but you know what? These people, these unlikely people that made big mistakes had one huge thing in common, and they took God at his word. When God told them to do something, they did it, even if it was completely illogical, even if it was beyond uncomfortable. They believed God, and they took him at his word. They had faith. Read with me verses 1 and 6. Now faith is confidence and what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists 
and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We may not be able to see, but he wants us to earnestly seek him and he promises to reward that. Paul goes on, though, in verse 35 and even in the verses surrounding it, and he says, but I don't want you to have divided interests. That's the next point tonight. Don't have divided interests. And I want to ask you tonight, what's on the throne of your heart? What's dividing your interests? See, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, it says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And I don't know about you, but I've heard a lot of people make a lot of excuses about why this verse does not apply to them and why they are the exception to this. There is one thing that will reign supreme on your heart of hearts, and I want to ask you, what is it? Maybe it's grades. Maybe it's hearing back about that job or getting this particular job or getting you know, this offer or um, grad school this or relationship that or friendship this or the fact that you don't have. Maybe the thing on the throne of your heart is the things that you don't have, the lack of relationships, the lack of friendships, the lack of a sense of belonging. What is that thing that you are tempted to place above God? The thing that you are not tempted to trust God with is probably the thing that's on the throne of your heart. Paul also tells us that he wants us to glorify God and to serve him faithfully. And I think this is woven throughout this passage, too. He's like, you know, whether you're married or whether you're single, I just want you to serve God the best that you can. Whether you're betrothed, whether you're widowed, I want you to serve God the best that you can. And I want you to glorify him. And I love this in Isaiah 48, verses 9 through 11. God says, for my own name's sake, I delay my wrath. For the sake of my praise, I hold it back from you so as not to destroy you completely. See, I have refined you, though not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do this. How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield my glory to another. See, we serve a God that is jealous for his glory. He does not take lightly when we put something else on the throne of our heart. He is jealous of that. And I got to say, that's kind of a dangerous thing to put whatever it is that's on the throne of your heart. Because you're saying, okay, God, I value this more than you. And I wonder sometimes if God's like, oh, really? Well, let's just see about that. Because you need to know that I matter more. Psalm 29, verses 1 through 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Guys, this is the purpose for why we were created. You want to know why sometimes you feel like your life is pointless? Maybe you need to check and see whether or not you are glorifying God, you are worshiping God, because that is what we were created for. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, Paul wrote that too. And I'm seeing this echo in Paul's letters and his writings that we are not to live like the world. We're supposed to live in a way that pleases God. We're supposed to glorify God, serve God, live for God. I see Paul telling us in this passage in 1 Corinthians 7, we're supposed to serve him faithfully, Deuteronomy 11:13. 13. So if you faithfully obey the commands I am giving you today, and there's a promise afterward, God is going to be there, he is going to be found. Psalm 2, 11, serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. So let's get practical. Because I find that it's easy when we talk about, oh yes, we need to have grace. Oh yes, have faith, trust God. How do you actually do those things? Because translating those, those ambiguous faith words that we so often use into real practical application can sometimes be difficult. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 8. And I know it's a long text, but it is packed with goodness. So bear with me. I know it's hot and it kind of wants to put us in a coma. I'm sweating beads down here too, I promise. His design power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. And first I want to point out, it's by his power we're able to do that. But he's shown us how to do it through his word. So he gave us the know-how and the ability. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. 
so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And I also want to ask you, do you know his promises? When you read scripture, are you looking for God's promises to you? Because how can you act out and ask him to fulfill those promises if you don't even know what they are? Verse 5, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to your goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That right there is the most practical application of how to do this that I could even begin to think to come up with. Goodness. Be good to one another. Know God. Know his word. Live with self-control. Persevere. Don't give up. Keep going even when it's difficult. Have godliness. Mirror God. Do what he tells us to do. Have mutual affection. Care for one another. Be compassionate. Care for each other. Take care of one another. Love each other. So how do we serve God faithfully? With discipline. And I don't think that discipline is just like, okay, don't do, don't do, don't do. But I think oftentimes discipline is knowing where you're headed, having your eye on this end goal of where you want to be and where you want to end up. Philippians chapter 3, 12 through 14 says, Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And I've heard the saying, if you don't know where you're aiming, you're going to hit it every time. If you don't have a place that you are aiming for, a thing that you are aiming towards, you're going to live an aimless life. And so I encourage you, know where you're aiming towards. Practically, what I often challenge people to do, think about who you want to be at 75 years old and set your life to be on a trajectory to hit that. You want to be a 75-year-old that when you pray, scripture just flows out of your mouth. When someone approaches you, you just ooze encouragement from your pores. At least that's who I want to be. If I want to be that kind of person, I need to start memorizing scripture now. If I want to be that kind of person, I need to be in the word diligently. If I want to be that kind of person, I need to practice encouraging other people now, not just expect it to happen overnight from my 74th into my 75th birthday. Know where you're headed with discipline. Also with self-control, it's work to get there. It doesn't happen easily. You want to be someone who knows scripture, memorize scripture, you have to actually work to do that. Romans chapter 6, 12 through 13 says, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that your body, you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God. Again, this idea of offering ourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Again, that idea that he wants all of you, not just part of you. We also do this with obedience in a way that pleases God. Deuteronomy 11 once says, Love the Lord your God and keep his requirements, his decrees, his laws, and his commandments always. There's not this caveat of when it's convenient for you, when it makes sense to you, when you like it. He says, all his decrees, all his laws, always. Revelation 14, 12, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. And I want to close with these few challenges to you. I want to challenge you, first of all, to quit making excuses for why you can't. And just obey God. Well, I can't do it because it costs too much. He's bigger. I can't do it because it's inconvenient. So? I can't do it because I just don't really want to. I don't know how God's going to work out the logistics. Okay, do it anyway. If he's telling you that he wants you to go on this missions trip or to say yes to this job opportunity that kind of defies what you thought you were going to be doing or, heaven forbid, he call you into ministry and not engineering, obey God. You're not going to regret it, I promise. Quit making excuses and obey God because he's bigger. Be willing to be uncomfortable. You know, last semester I often said embrace the awkward. Be willing to be uncomfortable. Get excited about it. Whether it's ministry, singleness, marriage, missions, friendships, major changes, careers, be willing to be uncomfortable because you're being obedient to God. We're not called to a passive faith. 
And I think oftentimes we are so willing to sit on the sidelines waiting for God to drop what he wants us to do in our lap. And we pray about these different problems. We're like, oh, God, please do this. And I think sometimes we forget we may be the answer to the prayer that we're praying. We're talking to God about these things, and he's just kind of looking at us, waiting for us to get the point, like, maybe I want you to do that. We're not called to a passive faith, but we are called to trust God and to live for him. We're going to pray, and then we're going to close in worship. But I want to challenge you guys to spend this time thinking about what sits on the throne of your heart and what's preventing you from living for God. You know, for the people in this context, Paul's saying, yeah, things are kind of hot and it's a little dicey right now and it looks like it's going to get a little worse. So if things need to be simplified for you because you can do it better that way, I agree. I think that's a great idea. If that's not how you can do it, then marriage, you know, it's fine and it's a good idea. But remember, above all else, live for the Lord. And that's what I want to challenge you guys to do, is to live for the Lord, whether it makes sense to you or it's uncomfortable. Pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, God, I just want to thank you so much for the power of your word and that it is one message, um, not multiple, that you do not contradict yourself. Um, I thank you for the invitation to camp out in uncomfortable places in your word. Um, And God, I ask that we would be willing to be uncomfortable for your glory, Um, that we would be willing to say yes to you in the ways that you're calling us to. And Father, I ask specifically tonight that you would help us to identify what it is that is vying for the throne of our hearts. And that we would be willing to take it down, to put it aside, and put you there and worship you as you created us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.